here on BBC One, we join BBC News 24, which is currently showing World Business Report. The action has, in itself, restored some of the market's battered confidence. Tom Johnston, BBC News, Jakarta. And the battered confidence is still there in New York. We may have seen on Monday that the markets moved up something of a relief rally. People were concerned that the hurricane would be even worse than it has turned out to be. Nonetheless, on Tuesday, people much more concerned about the oil price and how that was going to affect the inflation picture in the United States and uh, consumer confidence as well. So what we saw actually was a little bit of a sell-off. We saw the retailers falling back. Uh, we saw some of the home improvement companies that we'd seen gain ground on Monday. They came off as well. We saw the construction companies and also, more importantly, the transportation companies easing off, as Laura mentioned in her report. So by the close, we saw the Dow at 10,412. That's down 50 points. The Nasdaq at 2129, off just short of eight points. A rather more mixed picture here in Europe because, of course, the FTSE was closed on Monday. It's reopened this Tuesday. That's after a holiday. And as you can see, they're uh, really a mixed bag with oil stocks doing well because of the oil price. On the other hand, some of the stocks that did well in France and Germany on Monday falling back at the moment. Elsewhere, pharmaceuticals are doing well as well. If you want to get in touch with us, you can always send us some emails to thebiz at bbc.co.uk. Please keep those coming, please. Stay with the BBC. We've got much more news to come. Hello and welcome back. You're watching World Business Report. I'm Darshini David in London. And I'm Tanya Beckett in New York. Well, let's now bring you back to the subject of Hurricane Katrina. The area affected, of course, principally the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where we, there are considerable numbers of oil offshore platforms, just about 600 within 40 miles there of the coast. Many of those affected. We've seen pictures of what's been happening. Let me take you now specifically to the man who runs one port there in Louisiana. And it's called Port Fourchon. It's near New Orleans and it's where most of the boats that supply that area come and go from. Also, of course, the oil supply into the United States is very significant from that region, um, both from domestic and foreign oil. So let's uh, join the man who runs that port. He is Tel Falgut, and he runs Port Fouchon. Ted, uh, what's the state of the port at the moment? My understanding is uh, that it's closed. Uh, yes, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, certainly, uh, Port Fouchon is a very important energy port sitting at the, on the Gulf of Mexico and uh, certainly was in the path of the storm. Uh, luckily, the storm passed just to the west of our facilities, uh, excuse me, just to the east of our facilities. Uh, we were on the western edge and uh, we uh, did not suffer the full brunt of the storm. The port uh, did suffer considerable damage uh, and uh, it uh, is now we're clearing the roads, uh, trying to get uh, the port back into shape, uh, but certainly the offshore uh, infrastructure, uh, some of the transmission facilities and, and platforms and so forth uh, have uh, sustained considerable damage. You say you're getting an idea of what the damage is. What about the pipelines there? Presumably they're slightly less visible, so it's difficult to tell, but these are the pipelines, of course, which are very important for transporting oil onto the coast and into the United States. Well, the pipelines are certainly uh, a very important part of the transmission system and key, but uh, unfortunately that's one of the last things uh, we're going to be able to find out uh, about uh, their, uh, uh, if, if there's any considerable damage or not. Uh, first, uh, we have to get the port facilities uh, in operation to access uh, the offshore areas uh, and then get those offshore facilities uh, to a point where they can begin to uh, inspect the uh, transmission infrastructure, such as the pipelines, to determine if, in fact, we do have any major pipeline damage. Uh, it's clear that we have some drilling rigs uh, that are uh, loose, floating in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and some platform damage. Those are very visible from a helicopter, but uh, certainly uh, to get the vessels out to do the underwater work of uh, inspection and so forth is uh, a totally different uh, situation which will take a bit longer. Ted, I wish you all the very best with that recovery operation. 
going story because European clothing retailers and their suppliers may have been upset by tons of Chinese clothes embargoed at ports. But it seems they are not the only ones worried about this latest trade wrangle. United States trade officials have begun talks with their Beijing counterparts. And it seems that America also wants to cap the level of garment exports to the United States. Nigel Cassidy reports. Made in China, for America as for Europe, these goods in the making present them with a political problem. Customers want the cheaper clothes, but higher cost manufacturers in the West can't compete. And the very public standoff in Europe, over 75 million items which have reached quota levels, have made both the Americans and the Chinese determined to sort out their next agreement ahead of time. President Bush's chief textile negotiator, David Spooner, arrived to find the Chinese Vice Commerce Minister, Gao Husheng, keen to create, as his ministry put it, a stable environment. All that while in Europe, the EU Trade Minister, Peter Mandelson, warned of shortages of clothes if member states failed to release impounded Chinese textiles. The warnings of stock shortages on the shelves by Christmas have certainly galvanised the politicians into action. The truth is, for most large retailers, it will be possible to replace stock, usually bought from China. But for individual traders with stock impounded, the cost will be enormous. They'll also face a further dilemma. Do you source in new product now, not knowing whether or not you're going to have anything on the shelf in time for the autumn collection? Let's not forget that a fashion garment is a perishable item. So if you can't sell it in September and October of this year, then you're not going to be able to sell it at all. You're going to have to slash your prices and slash your margin. The other side of it is, if you do source in product but find that this issue is resolved next week, you're going to be left with double stock. So there's going to be a glut of product on the market, and that's going to have an obvious impact on margins as well, because everybody will be seeking to get rid of their stock as soon as possible. In Europe, many questions remain unanswered, such as who pays when retailers and their suppliers get caught in the crossfire. In some cases, they'll belong to the manufacturers because they haven't been paid. In some cases, they'll belong to the retailers. The impact, probably severest, um, for the retailers is those who have got particular merchandise, which is part of a collection, where the knock-on effect will be significant uh, because one particular product within a, a merchandise range just hasn't arrived. Uh, that has a knock-on sales effect, so that, that is significant. For shoppers, it's still never been easier to bag a bargain, but for the global textile industry, the move away from a long-standing multi-fibre agreement to freer trade is proving both chaotic and unpredictable. Nigel Cassidy, BBC News. Dan Eikenson now joins us from Washington. He's a trade policy analyst at the Cato Institute. Let's put these uh, discussions between the US and China in a wider context if we can, Dan. Um, how important is the textile industry in the US? That is to say, just how, far is, how, how hard is the United States going to fight here? Well, I would say it's a shame that in the year 2005, US trade policy is still held captive to the textile industry. Uh, it's a f fairly small industry, but uh, it does wield a lot of political power. We just passed the Central American Free Trade Agreement here in the United States, and uh, in order to win support from certain textile state representatives, I think the administration had to make certain promises to these textile producers that it would get tough with China, and these negotiations are, the, are, are an extension of that discussion. Equally, if it gets tough with China here, then it perhaps uh, loses its teeth over other issues which are also important in a trade context with China. Yeah, I, I, I believe that's correct. We have a lot of bilateral issues with, with China, uh, but the United States has been pushing uh, on the textile issue for quite some time. Uh, we were pushing with respect to currency manipulation, trying to compel China to let the value of its currency rise. Uh, China has agreed to that. It's, it will probably agree to a textile uh, restraint. Uh, we run out of political capital. How do we compel China to do the right thing on issues that are more important to the broader economy, things like intellectual property rights enforcement and China's uh, making good on its other WTO commitments? China eventually is going to say, uh, enough. So the United States uh, needs to uh, be a little bit more careful with the political capital that it has. Dan, thank you very much indeed for your insight. My pleasure. And the severe drought in southern Europe is sending olive oil prices to record highs. On the olive oil futures market, yes, there actually is such a thing, the price for January deliveries is up by 50% on last year, and that's going to mean higher prices in the shops. Our Europe business reporter, John Moylan, has been to Spain's southern province of Jaén, which accounts for a quarter of Europe's olive oil production.
Thomas Fernandez is one of the fortunate farmers in Jaén. Some of his olive trees are watered every day and are producing healthy fruit. But the rest are bare, following the worst drought in this region that many can remember. I've been growing olives for almost 30 years. The truth is, I've never seen a lack of water like this. There is no fruit on the trees, and if this continues, it will lead to the ruin of us. Spain is the world's biggest producer of olive oil. The southern province of Jaén is the center of the industry. Olive trees stretch as far as the eye can see, but this year the harvest will be poor. In a few months, Thomas will bring his olives here to be processed into oil. It's Spain's biggest olive oil cooperative. But the harvest is expected to be down 50% on last year. Many fear for their livelihoods. We're estimating that the reduction in incomes will be very serious. It won't just affect local farmers, but also the local economy, because 100% of the local economy depends upon the olive business. There are tens of millions of olive trees here in Jaén. The industry dominates the landscape and the local economy. So a prolonged drought here could have profound consequences, not just on the livelihoods of farmers, but for the global supply of olive oil. This residential street is the unlikely location for Spain's olive oil futures market. Here, exporters can limit their risk by buying future supplies. But prices are up 50% this year and are continuing to climb. Mm, olive oil market is a global market. The price in Spain go up, the price in, in Italy, in Greek, in Turkey, in Syria go up. But now the impact of the drought is being felt thousands of miles away. At this olive oil importer in London's trendy borough market area, business is good. For today's consumers, meals are not complete without a drizzling of extra virgin, and higher prices don't seem to be putting people off. As we approach the harvest, it's going to be less olive oil. So once the, the new harvest comes in, the production is going to be smaller. So we're expecting about 5 to 10 percent increase in prices. Back in Jaén, Tomas is hoping for a change in the weather. But if the rain in Spain does stay mainly on the plains, this region could face a difficult year ahead. John Moylan, BBC News, in Jaén province, Spain. So get your olive oil while you can. Just time to remind you very quickly of our email address. It's thebiz at bbc.co.uk. And this week, we want to hear about your experiences in online trading. And that's because it's the 10th anniversary of eBay. How time flies. I'm Darshini David in London for World Business Report. And I'm Tali Beckett in New York. Thanks for investing your time with the BBC. <laughs> Hello again. If you're not enjoying the heat, perhaps you're not sleeping because the temperatures are so high, I have some good news for you. By Thursday and Friday, it will be turning fresher, but certainly for most of Wednesday, it is going to be pretty hot and humid for most of us with lots of sunshine around. As I say, things turning a bit more comfortable by the end of the working week. But uh, quite a warm start to the day. Temperatures uh, dropping through the night, no lower than about 13 or 14 Celsius in the north, 16 to maybe no lower than 18 Celsius in central London to start the day. So a warm start to what will be a hot day. Lots of sunshine across England and Wales, but slowly out west things will start to change. And it's a very different story for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Not as hot here, and as you can see, outbreaks of rain are working their way in, particularly across the northwest of Scotland, where that rain could be quite heavy through the afternoon. Slowly that rain pushing south, we could see some in the central lowlands to end the day. Certainly most of England and Wales though will uh, stay dry through the afternoon with particularly in the east pretty high temperatures. Birmingham up to 26 degrees, Norwich maybe up to 28 Celsius, 82 Fahrenheit. The highest temperatures probably in the southeast corner topping 30 degrees here. The heat down to the southwest though will uh, develop a little bit more cloud come the afternoon and the likelihood of uh, one or two sharp showers, fairly scattered showers across the west country and Wales.
sales, but as I said, they could be on the sharp side as they develop through the afternoon. And things will be changing across Northern Ireland after a dry start, cloud and outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west. As you might imagine, with the cloud and the rain across Northern Britain, not as hot here, 18 to 20 degrees. But for England and Wales, quite widely up to 25 degrees Celsius and perhaps in that southeast corner reaching 31 Celsius, the hottest day of August. If we get a couple of degrees higher than that, we might tie with the hottest day of the year so far. But that heat will then cause further heavy downpours through Wednesday evening, particularly across parts of northern England and especially eastern Scotland. The high temperatures, the humidity building could cause some severe thunderstorms. Some uncertainty about that obviously will keep you posted, but certainly heavy showers in eastern areas tomorrow night, slowly clearing during Thursday, a scattering of showers developing further west on Thursday. Quite a lot of cloud on Thursday. It will be cooler, but where we see the sunshine, still quite warm in the southeast, temperatures peaking at 25 degrees Celsius. Fresher for all by Friday, and Friday's looking like a fine day with spells of sunshine, just a bit more cloud developing in the northwest, maybe a scattering of showers here, but generally a fine day on Friday and pretty pleasant with highs of 23 to 24. And at the moment, the start of the weekend not looking too bad. Again, a fine and dry day for most with some good spells of sunshine in the eastern temperatures, topping 22 or 23 degrees Celsius. That's all for now. The largest gathering of forensic experts ever are in a race against time. In these containers are the last remaining victims of the tsunami which hit Thailand on Boxing Day 2004. 4,000 bodies from 35 countries waiting to go home. The biggest global forensic operation in history. Horizon returns with tsunami, naming the dead, coming soon to BBC Two. This week on Talking Movies, raunchy comedies driving the box office, but not everyone is pleased. And movie outtakes, authentic moments, or a marketing gimmick. <laughs> Seventy-four concerts over two months. The BBC Proms lights up the nation. Rescue workers rush to help people stranded by Hurricane Katrina. Many hundreds are feared dead. Israel's former Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, challenges Ariel Sharon for leadership of his Likud party. Zimbabwe's parliament approves constitutional changes denying farmers the right of appeal against land seizures. And Kofi Annan cuts short his holiday to pursue crisis talks on the future of the United Nations. Hello, this is BBC News. I'm Jake Lynch. Welcome to the programme. A big rescue operation is continuing in the southern United States in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, one of the most devastating storms in American history. One official said he feared hundreds of people may have been killed, but details of casualties are still sketchy. In New Orleans, where dikes protecting the city from a nearby lake were breached, heavily armed police are now patrolling to stop looters. Across America's deluged deep south, 
Those who didn't flee Hurricane Katrina, who chose to wait the storm out, now wait for deliverance. There is another rooftop with another family. The rescue teams have plucked hundreds of people from their roofs and attics. She's comfortable on the rescue swimmer has given the thumbs up for the hoist rescue. Local radio stations have broadcast desperate pleas for help from those stranded, made on their cell phones as supplies of food and water dwindle. And through the day, America's been transfixed by the rescue efforts. As the day unfolded, the scale of the disaster in Louisiana and Mississippi became a little clearer. Across the two states, more than a million people have been forced from their homes by Katrina's stinking floodwaters. And the inevitable stories of personal tragedy began to surface. My wife. And where is she now? I can't find her body. She gone. You can't find your wife? Oh, she told me. Everybody. She told me. I tried. I, I, I hold her hand tight like I could. And she told me, you can't hold me. She said, take care of the kids. We can now just begin to see the power of Hurricane Katrina as she moved up the Gulf Coast through Monday. This is Biloxi, a seaside town in Mississippi. 55 people are confirmed dead in this area. 30, say local officials, died in the ruins of this apartment building. Why were they still there? And why wasn't the building strong enough to withstand the storm? Exactly what took place in Biloxi just isn't clear yet. But the physical evidence alone speaks of the 145 mile an hour winds, powerful enough to blow out a plate glass window or to reduce a whole life's work to nothing. Basically, we all have to start with our own backyards because, I mean, it's all just torn up. Everything. Everything. Looking at everything is so overwhelming, you just don't know how you would start, you know? In New Orleans, there was initially a feeling of relief that the center of the hurricane narrowly missed the city. But today, that feeling evaporated. Water levels here are still rising. Some of the dikes that protect this low-lying city have been breached, and a huge system of underground pumps is reported to be failing. For New Orleans, the storm has passed, but the danger is suddenly very real again. The magnitude of the situation is untenable. It's, it's actually, it's just heartbreaking. There were plenty of accounts of heroism and mutual help from the city's beleaguered citizens. While Katrina mauled the Deep South, President Bush was on holiday at his ranch in Crawford, Texas. He announced today he'll cut short the vacation and return to Washington. Right now, our priority is on saving lives. And we are still in the midst of search and rescue operations. I urge everyone in the affected areas to continue to follow instructions from state and local authorities. But as the relief effort ground into gear today, it was hard to know where in the devastated landscape had the worst of it. Some towns remain completely cut off, and Hurricane Katrina's true impact is still to be measured. Adam Brooks reporting. And while search and rescue operations represent the immediate priority, officials are also counting the financial cost of Hurricane Katrina. America's Gulf Coast is home to a major part of the country's oil industry, and the disruption has, has pushed prices to record highs. Oil companies are assessing the damage. The Gulf of Mexico is vital to the entire American oil infrastructure, with platforms, ports, pipes and refineries, some now underwater. The area has been badly hit at all levels. Today, uh, the market uh, were a bit panicky about the situation. Uh, obviously, yesterday they felt uh, uh, good about the fact that uh, the damage was not as catastrophic, but by today I think the realization is that uh, the oil infrastructure has been severely hit. The oil business involves two main processes. First is production, getting it out of the ground. 95% of the Gulf of Mexico region's production has been shut. Next, the crude oil gets to a refinery where it's turned into useful products, mostly petrol and diesel. Nine refineries have been shut, a tenth of U.S. refining capacity. 
it would be nice to think we had so much spare oil in the world we could afford to lose the Gulf of Mexico for a few days and barely notice. But it isn't like that. This is a very tightly run business. They don't sit on large amounts of spare oil doing nothing. Adding to the problem is the fact that global demand for oil has been growing and supply has barely been able to keep up. So there is no spare capacity in the world. As it happens, the US government does keep 700 million barrels of spare oil for a rainy day, the SPR, or Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Last year, the government lent crude oil to oil companies after Hurricane Ivan, but that may not help much this year. Why? Primarily because um, a lot of the refineries have been shut down. Um, crude oil doesn't really seem to be the problem. Um, the president, for example, has indicated his willingness to release crude from the SPR, but it's the uh, refining capacity that's the major problem. So in the U.S., because of the refining shortage, the retail price of gasoline may rise to a shocking $3 a gallon, 45p a litre. For petrol supplies in the U.K., the effect of the hurricane will be less obvious. But it's just what the oil market didn't need. Evan Davis, BBC News. While well, Jason Grumay is executive director of the National Commission on Energy Policy, a Washington research group looking into global environments and climate change. He says there's growing agreement in the scientific world of the link between climate change and Hurricane Katrina. I think that the eye of this storm um, reveals a great deal about uh, the struggles we have here in the U.S. and globally. I think that it is very, um, one must be very careful when trying to make a direct link between a particular reasonably localized effect and the broader global issues of climate change. But there is a growing scientific uh, agreement that the existence of the basically greater warming of the earth, the higher uh, sea levels, creates a greater risk of these kinds of dangerous storms. Well now, every international conclave attended by the Bush administration, America it seems is the lone voice holding out against really decisive action to tackle climate change. And at the same time, states and cities across the United States are going it alone, signing up to something very similar to the provisions of the Kyoto Protocol, for example. Which direction is this debate headed in? Jake, I think it's a, a very important point. I think actually um, a confluence of international, national and local events have really started to shift the debate here in the U.S. The, the recent G8 summit, and a lot of credit for this goes to uh, Prime Minister Blair, really helped to focus the world around three important facts. One is that we really moved beyond Kyoto. There's no real reasonable idea that the United States is going to join the Kyoto Treaty. Um, and I think that treaty and the debates about that have really become almost a, uh, a foil for inaction rather than an uh, obvious opportunity for action. Uh, but secondly, President Bush, for the first time on such a grand scale, acknowledged the uh, scientific consensus around climate change. And the G8 also brought uh, China and India and other countries into this discussion. So that's had a significant effect. Here in the U.S. Congress, just uh, last month, the majority of the U.S. Senate adopted a resolution calling for economy-wide mandatory market-based controls that would slow, stop, and reverse U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. That's a tipping point in this debate, and it erases the uh, conclusion from a decade ago that the United States was not ready to begin this process. Finally, as you point out, there are very significant efforts being undertaken in the cities and states of this nation. Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Pataki of New York, Romney of Massachusetts are all moving forward with plans. I, I would hesitate to suggest that they are in any way uh, equal in the uh, stringency to what was imagined for the U.S. under Kyoto. But they're significant steps. And when you put this all together, I think that there is a growing sense of inevitability that here in the United States we will join the world in moving forward with mandatory approaches to address climate change. Other news now, and the former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has announced he's to challenge the current Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, for the leadership of the Likud party. Mr Netanyahu resigned as finance minister earlier this month after bitterly opposing Mr Sharon's decision to forge ahead with the recent withdrawal of Jewish settlements from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. Well, Haggai Sigal is a lecturer on Middle Eastern politics with New York University in London, and he's just returned from Egypt, Israel and the occupied territories. He says it could be a messy fight. Well, it's remarkable. Um, Israel's very used to infighting between its political leaders, but the language of the last three days has been quite incredible. Um, directly today, out of the Prime Minister's office, uh, accusations of Netanyahu being a liar. Both have caused, called the other uh, completely incapable of being in government. Um, it's been already, and we're, we're already long away before this is even voted on in Likud, an incredibly messy fight between two people who are pretending to be fellow members of a government only weeks ago. 
Well now, Ariel Sharon has been thinking aloud recently about further pullbacks from settlements, retaining the major settlement blocks in the West Bank and basically pulling back from the others as part of a peace deal. That represents the centre ground of Israeli politics. Is that where Mr Sharon is now headed? Well, I, this is, I think, the fascinating debate. The big thing in Israel is a discussion about what's been called the Big Bang Thesis, an idea that Sharon, either by being forced to or in his own choice, is going to break, is going to form a centrist party, which is, by the way, what he formally could to be in the first place when he established him in 1973, to take the, the right away from the extreme right towards the centre, and that he will have a, a, a potential coalition, a marriage of convenience between the centre and between the Israeli left, and that together they'll be able to forge this kind of position. Sharon, while very different from the Labour in many ways, I think now there are certain shared goals about some of the potential ways in which a peace process can be achieved, both in terms of what they believe is, is viable to give, but also what they believe they need to keep in terms of security. Mr Netanyahu won the election to become Prime Minister, beating Shimon Peres on the back of a wave of suicide bombings mm. in Israel. To what extent does the outcome of this struggle now depend on events on the ground? Uh, it's, it's a vital issue and, and you're absolutely right and what has been very interesting in the past is that the suicide bombs te have tended to be very strong when Labour Prime Ministers are trying to be re-elected and they've tended not to happen when Likudniks have been in power. Some believe that this is almost a, 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 an I attempt to influence those kind of decisions, believing that almost a, a right-wing government might be good for, for the radicals. Uh, whether that's true or not, um, the potential effect of these things is tremendous. The fact that there have been no suicide bombings or very few for the last few months has allowed Sharon to withdraw from Gaza. If, the, if they had been on a daily or weekly basis, it would have been much harder for him to do so. So what happens there and also in terms of what Israel does, how the Palestinians react, and generally how the international community uh, view the actions of this government would be very important. And I think Sharon will be putting a lot of stock on his a speech to the UN soon where he's hoping to be treated as a, as, a, as a hero and a peacemaker and use that for political capital within his own party and within inside Israel. Hi guys, Sigal speaking to me earlier. And a former British finance minister or chancellor of the Exchequer, Kenneth Clark, has confirmed that he'll enter the race to lead Britain's opposition Conservative Party. Mr Clark, who's 65, has made two previous attempts to become leader. His pro-European views have made him unpopular in certain sections of the Conservative Party in the past, but he recently described the single European currency as a failure. You're watching BBC News. Still ahead on the programme. A new chapter in a writer's life, Salman Rushdie returns to the subject of Islam, 16 years after the Satanic Verses. A Dutch woman thought to have been the world's oldest person has died at the age of 115. She passed away in her sleep at a nursing home in the, in the north of the country. She had previously said her secret was a good diet and a love of football. Frail but feisty, Hendrika van Andelskeeper celebrated her 115th birthday in June. Born in 1890, she had lived through two world wars saying her longevity was down to a daily diet of pickled herring and orange juice, apparently for the vitamins. But on Tuesday she passed away in her sleep, something she had known was imminent. Last week she said, I think the moment is coming when the big management in the sky will say, it's been great, you've reached a great age, it's time for it to end, and that's what's happened. She'd been living in a nursing home for nearly 10 years. Before that, she'd looked after herself well into her hundreds. Friends remembered her with fondness. I remember the good years I spent with her, said this woman. She was a feisty lady. She knew what she wanted. The Guinness Book of World Records said the oldest living person was now a woman, also 115 living in the US state of Tennessee. Tim Allman, BBC News. And the headlines this hour. A big rescue operation is continuing in Louisiana and Mississippi following the devastation brought about by Hurricane Katrina. Many hundreds are feared dead. And the former Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has said he'll challenge Ariel Sharon for the Likud party leadership. Parliament in Zimbabwe has, pla has passed a series of changes to the constitution to restrict property rights. They'll deny farmers the right to appeal against the seizure of their land by the government.
result of the count is that 103 honourable members have voted in favour of the third reading of the bill. The Law Society of Zimbabwe has described President Robert Mugabe's controversial bill as an undisguised assault on the rights of Zimbabweans. Only 29 parliamentarians voted against the amendment to the constitution. The opposition movement for democratic change said the legislation is another blow to democracy in Zimbabwe. Is this a constitutional bill? Of course not. A constitution is for all times. It's not for a particular group, for a specific uh, purpose, for a particular time. Under the legislation, white farmers will no longer be able to legally challenge land seizures. The farms will be effectively nationalized and the courts will be prohibited from hearing appeals. So far, around 4,000 white farmers have lost their properties under a government program to redistribute land to the country's black population. The bill will also disenfranchise all those who have one or more foreign parents and who hold permanent residency status but not full citizenship. This will mainly affect white Zimbabweans of European descent. Those who have called for sanctions or military action against Mr Mugabe's government will be considered traitors and barred from travelling abroad. The legislation paves the way for a second chamber of parliament or senate. President Mugabe's ZANU-PF party already controls 107 seats in the 150-member lower house. Critics of the president expect him to tighten his grip on power by packing the 65-seat senate with his allies. ZANU-PF says the changes will allow the government to conclude its land reforms. Paul Anstis, BBC News. The United Nations Secretary General is cutting short his holiday and flying back to New York to try to sort out a row over plans for reform. Kofi Annan is under pressure to present his reform plans to a summit of world leaders next month. But John Bolton, America's controversial new ambassador to the world body, has tabled a number of wide-ranging changes. In all, he wants a total of 750 amendments to the global strategy plans. They include removing Millennium Development Goals dealing with poverty, education and disease targets and all references to the Kyoto Agreement on climate change. Well, the BBC's Michael Voss told me the next couple of weeks will be crucial for the reform plans. So it has proved and if it goes on for two weeks it's going to go right down to the right wire. You have to remember that in barely two weeks time possibly the largest gathering in history of world leaders is going to take place here in New York. It's the 60th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations and Kofi Annan had hoped that this would be the occasion when all world leaders would adopt a whole series of reforms, one, recommitting themselves to fighting pop, uh, poverty, but two, actually adopting a series of reforms that, that would remodel, renovate, re recreate, if you like, the United Nations, making it more relevant for the 21st century. And they thought that they had these plans in place. Um, there'd been six months of talks, six months of discussions, a large, almost 40-page document had been presented to the General Assembly. And then last week, the new U.S. Ambassador, John Bolton, said the U.S. didn't like it. They wanted major changes. And now it's a rush, really. It's a race against time to try and get something sorted out. Well, it's well documented that America in general, and this administration in particular, prefers ad hoc coalitions of the willing to joining in with world bodies like the UN, the UN at their head, of course. To what extent is the Bush administration making its historic one-off attempt to rewrite the whole basis of world governance here? I think to a degree, to a degree that, that is happening. The, the US administration would like to see a much slimmed down, less bureaucratic, more accountable organization, and certainly one that, 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 that is not a, an anti-American talking shop. The Americans would say they're looking for a more effective body, um, and one that focuses on, on, on key issues for the 21st century. They're particularly concerned about terrorism, and there's a lot of negotiations going on at the moment for, for what they hope will be a, a, a tough statement adopted by all world leaders. And it looks as if a compromise could be worked out on that. But when it comes to the issue of poverty, millennium development goals, I think they've got a major fight on their hands here. Michael Voss.
In Lebanon, three former security chiefs and the head of the Presidential Guard are being questioned about the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. From Beirut, Kim Hattas reports. News of the high-profile detentions broke while Lebanon's Prime Minister Fuad Sinyura was meeting with Detlev Melis, the German prosecutor heading the UN inquiry into the killing of Rafiq Hariri. Mr. Melis was sent to Lebanon in May by the Security Council after an initial UN probe found that the local inquiry was deeply flawed. Since then, legislative elections have brought the anti-Syrian opposition to power, including Mr. Senyura, a close ally of the Hariri family. Lebanese people, I address you today to assure you that no one will be above the law. Lebanon is fine at the end of the investigation. The world will only collapse on the heads of those who carried out the assassination. The killing of Mr. Hariri in February shook the country to its core. Anti-Syrian demonstrations swept the streets of Beirut and in April Syria withdrew its troops from the country. But it's taken more than six months for suspects to be named officially. Mr. Mellis is now questioning them here, at the headquarters of the UN investigative team in the hills overlooking Beirut. The detentions were made with permission from Lebanon's Justice Ministry and with the help of Lebanese police. <laughs> Jamil Sayed was Lebanon's General Security Chief. Raymond Azar was the head of military intelligence. Ali Hajj headed the internal security forces and was once in charge of late Mr. Hariri's security. And Mustafa Hamdan is the head of the Presidential Guard, the only pro-Syrian security chief to remain in his post. The fifth suspect is Nasser Qandil, a former legislator. He was in Damascus when the police came looking for him at dawn, but he returned to Lebanon during the day and was met at the border by the police. It's unclear exactly what the role of the five men may have been. They can now be held for several days before being released or charged. Kim Ratas, BBC News, Beirut. In 1989, the writer Salman Rushdie was facing an Iranian-inspired fatwa calling for his death over his book The Satanic Verses. Now, in his new novel, Shalimar the Clown, he's once again tackling the theme of Islam. Salman Rushdie's novel Shalimar the Clown is partially set in the Kashmir Valley, an idyll riven by violence. It's a story about love, betrayal and, in part, Islamic extremism. He had no language in common with the people for whom he was carrying out the hit. But one-eyed Talib had sent Zahir the boy with him to be his translator and aid. Talib said that Zahir the boy spoke excellent Arabic and it was time he became a man. It's being talked about as Rushdie's best novel in recent years and encapsulates how world events since September the 11th have shaped the writer's view. Now the world is so interconnected and so small that really in a way all our stories are one story. You know, and I think for me it's come to really affect how I've thought about writing, you know, that, that uh, it seems to be necessary to try and show a little bit about how the world connects now, you know, rather than pretend that we can just have a story in one place which is not affected by, uh, by events anywhere else. Rewind to 1989 and another Rushdie novel exemplified the connections between different countries. The satanic verses transformed Salman Rushdie into the best-known writer in the world. The late Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran declared the novel blasphemous and imposed a death sentence. The writer went into hiding for nearly a decade. That experience and Islamic extremism since then have hardened his views on the faith he was born into. Particularly now, um, and particularly for Muslim communities living in the West, you know, I think it is a crisis moment. You know, I, I think religions do face moments of crisis, and I think Islam is at such a moment. It needs to decide how it's going to move into the modern world, whether it's going to remain in the grip of very old-fashioned men. They are all men, you know, um, who resist all new ideas, or whether it's going to become, as in its time Judaism began, uh, became, and as in its time Christianity became, a genuinely modern philosophical inquiry. For a man with his experience of extremist religious views, it might seem foolhardy for Rushdie to call for reform in Islam. But in the current international climate, intellectual rigor is for him a priority. Razia Iqbal, BBC News. 
The main news, rescue operations are underway in the southern United States after Hurricane Katrina. Hundreds are feared dead. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Hello again. If you are not enjoying the heat, perhaps you're not sleeping because the temperatures are so high, I have some good news for you. By Thursday and Friday, it will be turning fresher, but certainly for most of Wednesday, it is going to be pretty hot and humid for most of us with lots of sunshine around. As I say, things turning a bit more comfortable by the end of the working week. But uh, quite a warm start to the day. Temperatures uh, dropping through the night, no lower than about 13 or 14 Celsius in the north, 16 to maybe no lower than 18 Celsius in central London to start the day. So a warm start to what will be a hot day. Lots of sunshine across England and Wales, but slowly out west things will start to change. And it's a very different story for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Not as hot here, and as you can see, outbreaks of rain are working their way in, particularly across the northwest of Scotland where that rain could be quite heavy through the afternoon. Slowly that rain pushing south, we could see some in the central lowlands to end the day. Certainly most of England and Wales, though, will stay dry through the afternoon, with particularly in the east, pretty high temperatures. Birmingham up to 26 degrees, Norwich maybe up to 28 Celsius, 82 Fahrenheit. The highest temperatures probably in the southeast corner, topping 30 degrees here. The heat down to the southwest, though, will develop a little bit more cloud come the afternoon, and the likelihood of uh, one or two sharp showers, fairly scattered showers across the west country and Wales, but as I say, they could be on the sharp side as they develop through the afternoon. And things will be changing across Northern Ireland after a dry start, cloud and outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west. As you might imagine, with the cloud and the rain across Northern Britain, not as hot here, 18 to 20 degrees. But for England and Wales, quite widely up to 25 degrees Celsius and perhaps in that southeast corner reaching 31 Celsius, the hottest day of August. If we get a couple of degrees higher than that, we might tie with the hottest day of the year so far. But that heat will then cause further heavy downpours through Wednesday evening, particularly across parts of northern England and especially eastern Scotland. The high temperatures, the humidity building could cause some severe thunderstorms. Some uncertainty about that obviously will keep you posted, but certainly heavy showers in eastern areas tomorrow night, slowly clearing during Thursday, a scattering of showers developing further west on Thursday. Quite a lot of cloud on Thursday. It will be cooler, but where we see the sunshine, still quite warm in the southeast, temperatures peaking at 25 degrees Celsius. Fresher for all by Friday, and Friday's looking like a fine day with spells of sunshine, just a bit more cloud developing in the northwest, maybe a scattering of showers here, but generally a fine day on Friday and pretty pleasant with highs of 23 to 24. And at the moment, the start of the weekend not looking too bad. Again, a fine and dry day for most with some good spells of sunshine in the eastern temperatures, topping 22 or 23 degrees Celsius. That's all for now. Seventy-four concerts over two months. The BBC Proms lights up the nation. Hello, I'm Jake Lynch with the main news. A big rescue operation is underway in the southern United States after one of the most devastating storms in American history. It's not yet clear how many people have died as a result of Hurricane Katrina, but rescuers fear the final number will be in the hundreds. Many towns and roads in Mississippi and Louisiana are submerged, making it impossible to get supplies to those in need. In New Orleans, floodwaters are rising after dikes protecting the city from a nearby lake were breached. The former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has announced he's to challenge the current Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, for the leadership of the Likud party. Mr Netanyahu resigned as finance minister earlier this month after bitterly opposing Mr Sharon's decision to forge ahead with the recent withdrawal of Jewish settlements from Gaza and parts of the West Bank.
The former Chancellor, Kenneth Clark, has decided to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Mr Clark, who is 65, has made two previous attempts to become leader, but his pro-European views have made him unpopular in certain sections of his party in the past. Supporters of Mr Clark have welcomed the news, saying it would be a boon for the Conservatives in the next election. And I think it does mean that the one person in the Conservative Party who even his enemies would acknowledge is an equal match for Gordon Brown or Tony Blair uh, will be actually available to become leader. Police in Newcastle are looking for two men who are believed to have tied a young mother's hands, set fire to her house and then left her and her baby to die. The woman, Danielle Wales, who's 21, managed to dial 999 with her tongue and survived, but her four-month-old son died. A woman in her early 20s has been arrested and bailed in connection with the inquiry. Northumbria police say they're still looking for two men. A nurse who was accused of killing three of her patients has been found dead at her home in Lancashire. And Greg Booth was due to go on trial next year for the murder of three elderly women at Airedale General Hospital in West Yorkshire. Police say they believe she may have killed more patients. The Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, is to face a disciplinary hearing for likening a Jewish newspaper reporter to a Nazi concentration camp guard. He'll appear before the Independent Adjudication Panel for England to face allegations that he failed to treat others with respect or brought his office into disrepute. The panel has the power to ban him from public office for up to five years if it decides he's guilty. All the day's sports news now with Dominic Cotton. Hello again. Well, Michael Owen is uh, very soon to be unveiled officially as a Newcastle player. Having passed a medical, a fee of around £16 million has been agreed and Owen will sign a four-year deal. He leaves at Real Madrid after a challenging year in Spain. Owen's first choice club had been Liverpool, but they wouldn't match Newcastle's big money offer. They don't waste any time on Tyneside. This is a truly memorable transfer. The letters on the back of the famous shirt are almost as fresh as the words on the Newcastle website, confirming Michael Owen's move. In essence, it's the classic deal. Player needs a club, club needs a player. All through the signing saga, Graham Souness has made it clear why he wanted to maintain negotiations. I think um, when you're signing good players, um, not only the players that you're looking to sign, but the ones you've already signed will be lifted by them. I think Michael Owen um, is one of the best goal getters around today. I think it's great myself. Like, I think it's going to be a class sign. I know I paid quite a lot of money, but it's going to be worth it in the end, you know. And it's just going to give with 20 goals a season. But at Anfield, the news has been met with disappointment and more than a few raised eyebrows. Making a mistake, isn't it? Going to a club that's not even in Europe. I mean, it's just. I think it's got. To, it's got to do with money more than anything else. When you can come to the champions of Europe and instead you decide to go to Newcastle, they're going to finish mid-table at best, but the manager won't even see the month out. Ridiculous move. Owen is the rarest of commodities, a reliable centre-forward, with a goal in every two games throughout his Liverpool career. He's desperate to regain his best form to be ready for England's pivotal year. So far, it's a deal which suits all parties, even if Owen is the reluctant record signing. Ian Kemp, BBC News. So much of the talk at the England training camp has been of Michael Owen. This is what head coach Sven Joran Eriksson had to say about the striker's move. As long as it makes uh, Michael Owen happy, it's good news for England and good news for, for me. Uh, great club, fantastic. He will play regular football, much more regular than he did last season. And I, I suppose he's happy, very happy. And I think it's very good to play together with each other. He's the big target man. And, good header and he will give uh, Michael many chances to score, I'm sure about that. Well, Ericsson has had a few problems to contend with. Uh, Chelsea defender John Terry has been ruled out of Saturday's World Cup qualifier against Wales because of a knee injury. David Beckham and Chris Kirkman also missed training, although neither is thought to have a serious problem. Well, Terry reported for duty with the squad today, but uh, uh, was sent back to his club for treatment after being assessed by medical staff. He was hurt. Uh, during this weekend's Premiership win against Tottenham. Jamie Carragher or Matthew Upson are likely replacements. Well, England are expecting a tough test against Wales on Saturday afternoon. The Welsh can't now qualify for next year's World Cup finals, but that doesn't rule out the possibility of an upset. This is a time where we, it's actually a time in your career, an international game, where you can actually go and try and enjoy it. And, you know, not try and get too nervous about the crowd and, and what's at stake and stuff because there's basically nothing at stake. There's just a chance to go and beat England and that's it. You know, we can't qualify. 
you know, um, there shouldn't be any real pressure on us. Um, so it is, it is a game that we can hopefully go and try and enjoy it, and that's what the manager wants us to do. To tennis now on a back injury. Hasten Tim Hemmons exit uh, in the first round at the US Open Championships. The British number one was never in his match against the unseeded Fernando Verdasco. The Spaniard won the first set 6-4 and was then even more dominant, taking the second and third sets by six games to two. Well, a win for Greg Rosetsky would have allowed him to replace Hemmons as the British number one, but it didn't come. He lost in straight sets as well against the wildcard James Blake. 7-5, 7-6, 6-3, the final score there. The defending men's champion and world number one Roger Federer, meanwhile, had a comfortable win in his first round match against Ivo Mina. He took uh, over just, just over an hour to beat his Czech opponent in straight sets. That's all the sport for now. There'll be more later here on News 24. Thanks, Dominic. And don't forget, you can keep up to date with all the headlines, weather and sport through our interactive service. Just press the red button and follow the on-screen instructions. I'll be back in 10 minutes with the latest headlines, but now on BBC News 24, a look at the world through American eyes in ABC's World News Tonight, as seen across the States a couple of hours ago. Tonight, the overwhelming, catastrophic damage from Hurricane Katrina. In New Orleans, the city that thought it dodged a bullet, it's now a disaster zone. Water everywhere. Looting has begun. And now they're going to evacuate the shelters. In Mississippi, it looks like a bomb went off. There are fears that hundreds could be dead, so many of them poor. And the survivors, desperate and stranded. Hundreds of daring rescues, Coast Guard and National Guard helicopters perform nonstop. Tonight, a special edition of World News Tonight. State of emergency on the Gulf Coast. From ABC News, this is World News Tonight. Reporting from ABC News headquarters, Charles Gibson. Good evening. Hurricane Katrina seems destined to be the most costly natural disaster in American history. Last night, we began this broadcast saying Katrina was bad, very bad. Well, last night, we didn't know the half of it and we are still learning just how bad. This was a common sight today. Helicopters and rescue teams lifting people one by one, hundreds and hundreds in all from rooftops. Along the Gulf Coast, different cities, different problems. In New Orleans, we have a major American city underwater. New Orleans thought it had been spared the worst, and then two major levees broke and slowly the city has filled with water. Canal Street is now a canal. The city is going to be essentially uninhabitable for many days. In Gulfport, Mississippi, it was by contrast very sudden. A 25-foot high wall of water swept ashore in the storm surge, and that essentially destroyed the coastline. In Biloxi, Mississippi, the mayor called that storm surge our tsunami. And as it swept as much as a mile inland, hundreds may have been killed. One medical researcher said today they won't quit counting bodies for a while. We devote our entire broadcast tonight to the chaos caused by Katrina. We have correspondents all along the Gulf Coast, and we start with ABC's Jeffrey Kaufman in New Orleans. The city that sits below sea level is now undersea. Overnight, there were two breaches in the levee system that protects New Orleans. One is 200 feet long, allowing the waters of Lake Pontchartrain to pour in. The elaborate system of pumps failed. I mean, everything is just flooded. Everything, the whole city, the whole city. This is like a city under siege. Last night, in the hours after Hurricane Katrina had moved on, only a handful of neighborhoods were waterlogged. Today, in some areas, the water is now 20 feet deep. People who thought they were unscathed by Katrina woke up to rising floodwaters. The city is now cut off from the outside. The main I-10 bridge to the east, shredded by Katrina's storm surge. Other access routes underwater. What I saw today is equivalent to what I saw flying over the tsunami in Indonesia. There are places that are no longer there. Officials estimate that 80% of New Orleans is now underwater, and this afternoon that water was still rising. Helicopters spent the day on a virtual house-to-house -house search from the air, looking for stranded families. Coast Guard choppers hovered over houses and delicately lowered rescue baskets, winching stranded survivors one by one. National Guard teams carefully lifted people into the air on rescue seats. On the ground, a different picture. Boats lined up with families rescued from second stories, attics, and rooftops. 
It is now 10.40 in the morning. The water here is a foot deep. The water there much, much deeper. 12 hours ago, we drove on these streets, and they were completely dry. And what nature isn't ravaging, looters are. Thousands have declared open season. Anything that sits unguarded is being picked over. Police, there were a few standing idly by downtown. We're trying. We're trying to do as best we can right now with everything we have. It is clear the city police do not have enough. Unprepared and overwhelmed, in most neighborhoods, it is pure anarchy. The number of looters is far more than the number of officers. And police told us they have nowhere to put people they apprehend, and their police cars are running out of gas. For people just struggling to pull their lives together, scenes like this are devastating. This ain't no time for this here foolishness, but people trapped. A lot of them hungry, don't have no water, need medicine. I need insulin right now. The Louisiana National Guard is here, but its priority is people, not property. Convoys of high water vehicles are taking weary refugees to the only higher ground left, the Superdome. It too, though, will have to be evacuated. You'd be amazed how many uh, places need help. And we're, and we're doing everything we can to get as many people as we can as fast as, as fast as we can. Those who are not heading to the Superdome are trying to find some other way out of town. This family, with its 92-year-old grandmother, tried to get out by water. Well, uh, the house started flooding real bad, so we decided to uh, take the boat and float down to the hotel. But uh, this is as far as we can go because it's so shallow. But beyond the tourist areas, this is a poor city. Many struggled to survive before Katrina hit. Basically, New Orleans is a city of poverty-stricken people, so you can imagine how even more the poverty is going to be now. New Orleans knew that an epic catastrophe was only a hurricane away. Initially, it looked like Katrina was not going to be the one. Jeffrey Kaufman, ABC News, New Orleans. Across the border in Mississippi, it is a matter of finding and counting the bodies. It was a wall of water that inundated the coastal communities of Gulfport and Biloxi. Unlike New Orleans, people in Mississippi had no time to get to the rooftops. ABC's Terry Moran is in Gulfport, Mississippi, tonight. Terry? Charlie, when we arrived here this morning, we had to take a moment simply to absorb the sheer scale of the devastation here. For the people of this city, much of Gulfport has essentially ceased to exist. Downtown Gulfport looks like a bomb went off. Buildings lie in rubble. Whole neighborhoods are obliterated. Power lines strewn through the streets and the port of Mississippi is a wreck. Katrina took the casino barges that lined this coast and tossed them on the shore like toys, crushing homes beneath them. In Harrison County, which includes the state's coastal community, the death toll so far is at least 80 and expected to rise. One million people along this coast are without power. Tens of thousands have been left homeless. Officials say it will be at least a week before those who evacuated will be able to return. It's beyond imagination. I never thought I'd see something that looked worse than Camille, but this looks worse than Camille. For some, there is nothing to come home to. Hiram Stewart was in the hospital yesterday when his home was destroyed. I've never seen anything like it. No. I never will, I don't believe. This neighborhood is one of the oldest in Gulfport. It's located just a few hundred feet from the beach right over there. When the storm surge from Katrina roared through here, it lifted up cargo containers, barges, these huge two-ton rolls of paper, and wiped everything out. And not everyone who lived here has been accounted for yet. Harvey Jackson's home was split in half. His wife was swept away. Who was at your house with you? My wife. And where is she now? Can't find her body. She gone. So much has been lost here, and people are still reckoning the damage. In Biloxi, where a 25-foot wall of water came ashore, the city's waterfront was demolished. Rescuers went door to door, sometimes using an axe to look for bodies. I'm tired of finding them. I mean, it's, it's senseless death. Right. Uh, Many people along this coast decided to stay during the storm. Some believed they would be spared. Others were concerned about the chaos afterwards. The looting and everything else that that accompanies the aftermath of a storm. I just wanted to be here. 1,600 Mississippi National Guard personnel now patrol these streets. More are on their way from neighboring states. 
Already in the sweltering heat, tempers are flaring. Many here are in despair. And I don't know what I'm going to do now. Today in Mississippi, hope is hard to come by. Right now, the human costs are the biggest concern, but over time, the economic costs, the lost tourism revenue, the devastated port, all of the destroyed businesses, it's just staggering. It will reach, officials say, Charlie, easily into the billions of dollars. Terry Moran, tonight in Gulfport, Mississippi. Well, sometimes numbers can't fully convey the story. Numbers of dead or numbers of homeless or numbers of dollars in damage. Sometimes you have to focus on individual stories. And so we asked ABC's David Curley to focus on one block on Howard Street in the devastated city of Biloxi, Mississippi. David? Charlie, this is a close-up look of what a wall of water can do. These were modest homes here in Biloxi. Many of them survived Hurricane Camille 40 years ago, but as their owners learned today, they were no match for Katrina. Where were you at? A family reunited in front of all that is left of their home, a foundation. Justin Duvall stayed behind when his parents evacuated. Where was he? He won't tell me. So uh, it had to be way around here. Parts of this neighborhood, Possum Hollow, are a quarter mile from the beach, but felt the full force of the 20-foot wave surge. As the water engulfed a small apartment building that Herbert Elsie manages, he had a plan, which some residents were afraid to follow and I pulled myself across on the rope and I couldn't get the other people to go. I think there's about six of us survived out of uh, 14, I think. Yellow tape now marks the spot of eight bodies, tenants who were crushed when the building finally gave way. Across the street, seven other bodies were found today. My house is out in that pile back there. Those who heeded the warnings and evacuated did return today. Louise Ross found clothes in her dryer, but little else. Doesn't matter the whole house is gone. Finding that little crystal basketball that belonged to my grandson just meant so much. Finding my pet rock meant so much. Because you cannot ever replace that kind of stuff. Come on, come with your mom. Let's put that American flag up. We're, we're down, but we're not out. Katrina has taken so much here. The houses are gone. But for many, this will once again be home. We're not going to leave. She, she kicked our butt. She won the battle but we won the war, so we're going to stay here, right here. Four more bodies have been discovered. The death toll just in this small neighborhood is 19. It will be another day before all those bodies are removed, and many more days before this neighborhood, Possum Holly, is livable again. Charlie? David Curley on Howard Street in Biloxi, Mississippi. To return to New Orleans for a moment, the water in many parts of that city is now, as you've seen, rooftop high. An engineer who works with the city of New Orleans told us if the entire system of dikes and pumps were working, they could siphon off one inch of water per hour or a foot every 12 hours. Of course, that's if there were no gaps in the dikes, all the pumps were working, and there were electricity to power them. And one more thing, city officials say the water is turning into a toxic mixture of sewage, garbage, gas, and chemicals. Katrina's punch is still being felt as it moves northward, bringing heavy rains and tornadoes. It's expected to be in Pennsylvania by tomorrow morning. In western Georgia, Katrina spawned bands of storms and tornadoes. Homes and buildings were flattened. One person was killed. In further north in Georgia, another tornado ripped the second floor off an Econo Lodge in Helen. Some of the people in that town had fled there to get away from Katrina. The White House says President Bush will cut short his vacation at his Texas ranch to deal with the storm. The president will head back to the White House tomorrow to oversee the government's response to the hurricane. When we come back, convoys from around the country head to the disaster zone, bringing food, medical supplies, and teams of volunteers. How long will it take to get them to those in need? Katrina's cruel hand, hardest hit were the poor who didn't have cars or the means to escape. And the headlines this hour. A big rescue operation is continuing in the states of Louisiana and Mississippi following the devastation brought about by Hurricane Katrina. Many hundreds are feared dead. Israel's former Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has said he'll challenge Ariel Sharon for the Likud party leadership. Here, the former Chancellor Ken Clark has thrown his hat into the ring for the leadership of the Conservative Party.
I'll be back with a full bulletin of news at four, but now we return to World News Tonight. Analysts will be trying to size up the economic impact of Hurricane Katrina for a long time, but today one trader said it was the most chaotic day for the energy markets in 20 years. Oil, gas, natural gas, and heating oil all surged to new records. 95% of oil production along America's Gulf Coast has been shut down, and traders do not know how much permanent damage there may have been. That uncertainty, combined with the record demand around the world, has the markets very skittish. As the pictures of Katrina's fury flashed across the news, Americans began to mobilize for the largest relief effort this country has ever seen. Convoys of food, baby formula, clothes, and medical supplies headed south. Teams of volunteers started out. No one knows how long it's going to take them to get through to the places that need them the most, but they are on their way. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. From Los Angeles, specially trained firefighters are heading to the hurricane zone with their rescue equipment. From Virginia, an urban search and rescue team. At a certain point when you've lost everything, uh, you're, almost, you're desperate for hope. From New Jersey, 10 utility trucks to help restore power. If you took all four hurricanes last summer, which were huge in, in and of themselves, combined them, we believe that what the Red Cross and others are doing is going to exceed uh, last summer's efforts. The Red Cross is mobilizing thousands of volunteers from across the country, people who will spend weeks away from work and family. They've also got call centers in major cities for those stranded in the disaster area. French speaker Rebecca Callahan has been dealing with people of Cajun descent. The majority of those know some English also, but they tend to panic and actually go into their native language originally. The Red Cross, along with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, have set up hundreds of shelters where they're providing food and medical assistance. At some point, however, the focus will shift from rescue and relief efforts to the enormous job of building temporary housing for the thousands of people whose homes are now destroyed. One FEMA official in New Orleans today said they're now starting to scope out dry land on which to place temporary homes. They might build those homes from scratch or maybe even bring in a massive number of trailers and mobile homes. They're even talking about possibly bringing in a floating dormitory. Literally nothing will be off the table, but with something as widespread as this, we're gonna be reinventing New Orleans. The one thing everyone involved in the relief effort vowed today was that in the face of such daunting destruction, even though it may take years, they will eventually rebuild. Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Last weekend, as tens of thousands of people fled New Orleans after being ordered to evacuate, one woman said, I don't have a car. I can't afford to rent one. I have to stay. It always seems the case. Natural disasters disproportionately affect those who can least afford to lose what they have. Hurricane Katrina, no exception. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. Katrina was especially cruel to the poor. In New Orleans, a quarter of the residents live below the poverty line. The very poorest live on the lowest land, south of Lake Pontchartrain, where the water is up to their rooftops. It's, it's just a thing that, uh, that always happens. The one that have the least seem like they'll hit harder than anything else. Rebuilding will be extremely difficult. Most of these families have no insurance of any kind. Uh, don't nobody give me any kind of assistance. I'm just going to have to try to do it piece by piece, uh, piece wood by wood, paycheck by paycheck. <laughs> More than 700,000 people in this region live in mobile homes. Unlike wealthier residents who lost boats and beach houses, one in six have no car and no way out of town. They are mostly African-American and filled the Superdome in every available shelter from New Orleans to Pensacola. They may live in substandard housing that is not as resistant to damage. In Mobile's housing projects where there is no power, information. residents have only their car radios for critical disaster news. Evelyn King just learned it could take a month before her lights are turned back on. Oh, they get the lights on here? Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Jelana Law has a seven-month-old baby born premature who needs a heart monitor and oxygen. Yeah. Both use electricity. Well, they're running off battery now, but battery doesn't last them long. With no health insurance, the family says they can't get the baby into a hospital. You can't let that control you. You just, you just gotta keep trying to find other options. Many of the storm's victims were already hard on their luck and are now struggling to get by one day at a time.
Steve Osinzami, ABC News, Mobile, Alabama. So many pictures that we saw today leave an indelible impression, and we want to close tonight with just a couple of more. This picture, a group of prisoners who were not allowed to leave New Orleans. Their jail was flooded, so the guards ferried them in small boats to an overpass. And you just have to wonder what they must have been thinking as the storm came in, and then today as the water began to rise. And then there was this picture, people who did what they could to attract attention. We don't know if it's their house, and we don't know if they were rescued. But like so many other people in the way of the hurricane, they are coping. I'm Charles Gibson, and for all of us here at ABC News, good night. Hello there. It's not going to be hot and humid everywhere, but certainly for most of England and Wales, Wednesday will be probably the hottest day of August. Perhaps temperatures getting close to the highest they've been throughout this year. Now, that's for England and Wales. As I said, not quite so for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Not as hot here. Wet weather, in fact, pushing into the northwest of Scotland at the moment, and that rain steadily working southwards through the day. Lots of hot sunshine for England and Wales, but even here in the west, we'll see the cloud bubbling up. One or two scattered showers for the afternoon, but it's definitely the wettest place, I think, western Scotland through the day ahead. Some of that rain heading down towards the central lowlands through the second half of the afternoon. For eastern England, it will be a hot and sticky one. Lots of hazy sunshine here. Highs of 28 in Norwich, 82 Fahrenheit. In that southeast corner will top at over 30 Celsius, 31, possibly 32 in places. The hot weather, though, will allow the cloud to bubble up across southwest England. And although they'll be fairly well scattered, there could just be one or two sharp showers developing across parts of the West Country and central and eastern parts of Wales come the afternoon. After a dry start, things changing in Northern Ireland too, with cloud and rain pushing in from the west. And with the cloud and the rain across Scotland and Northern Ireland, not so hot here, highs of 20 degrees, but widely temperatures over 25 Celsius in England and Wales, with top of the shop in that southeast corner, 31 or possibly 32. 32 would be 90 Fahrenheit. But the heat then causing more heavy downpours during Wednesday evening. Some thunderstorms down the eastern side of England, across northern England, particularly eastern Scotland, there could be some torrential downpours. The threat of flooding here overnight before those heavy showers clear away on Thursday. Much more cloud on Thursday, a scattering of showers in the west and not quite so hot. That's all for now. This week on Talking Movies, raunchy comedies driving the box office, but not everyone is pleased. And movie outtakes, authentic moments, or a marketing gimmick. <laughs> the largest gathering of forensic experts ever are in a race against time. In these containers are the last remaining victims of the tsunami which hit Thailand on Boxing Day 2004. 4,000 bodies from 35 countries waiting to go home. The biggest global forensic operation in history. Horizon returns with tsunami, naming the dead, coming soon to BBC Two. Rescue workers rushed to help people stranded by Hurricane Katrina. Many hundreds are feared dead. Israel's former Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, challenges Ariel Sharon for leadership of his Likud party. Zimbabwe's parliament approves constitutional changes, denying farmers the right of appeal against land seizures. And Kofi Annan cuts short his holiday to pursue crisis talks on the future of the United Nations.
Hello, this is BBC News. I'm Jake Lynch. Welcome to the programme. A big rescue operation is continuing in the southern United States in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, one of the most devastating storms in American history. One official said he feared hundreds of people may have been killed, but details of casualties are still sketchy. In New Orleans, where dikes protecting the city from a nearby lake were breached, heavily armed police are patrolling to stop looters. Across America's deluged deep south, those who didn't flee Hurricane Katrina, who chose to wait the storm out, now wait for deliverance. There is another rooftop with another family. The rescue teams have plucked hundreds of people from their roofs and attics. She's comfortable and the rescue swimmer has given the thumbs up for the hoist rescue. Local radio stations have broadcast desperate pleas for help from those stranded, made on their cell phones as supplies of food and water dwindle. And through the day, America's been transfixed by the rescue efforts. As the day unfolded, the scale of the disaster in Louisiana and Mississippi became a little clearer. Across the two states, more than a million people have been forced from their homes by Katrina's stinking floodwaters and the inevitable stories of personal tragedy began to surface. My wife. And where is she now? Can't find her body. She gone. You can't find your wife? Oh, she told me, but she told me I tried. I, I, I hold her hand tight as I could. And she told me, you can't hold me. She said, take care of the kids. We can now just begin to see the power of Hurricane Katrina as she moved up the Gulf Coast through Monday. This is Biloxi, a seaside town in Mississippi. 55 people are confirmed dead in this area. 30, say local officials, died in the ruins of this apartment building. Why were they still there? And why wasn't the building strong enough to withstand the storm? Exactly what took place in Biloxi just isn't clear yet. But the physical evidence alone speaks of the 145 mile an hour winds, powerful enough to blow out a plate glass window or to reduce a whole life's work to nothing. Basically, we all have to start with our own backyards because, I mean, it's all just torn up. Everything. Everything. Looking at everything is so overwhelming, you just don't know how you would start, you know? In New Orleans, there was initially a feeling of relief that the center of the hurricane narrowly missed the city. But today, that feeling evaporated. Water levels here are still rising. Some of the dikes that protect this low-lying city have been breached, and a huge system of underground pumps is reported to be failing. For New Orleans, the storm has passed, but the danger is suddenly very real again. The magnitude of the situation is untenable. It's, it's actually, it's just heartbreaking. There were plenty of accounts of heroism and mutual help from the city's beleaguered citizens. While Katrina mauled the Deep South, President Bush was on holiday at his ranch in Crawford, Texas. He announced today he'll cut short the vacation and return to Washington. Right now, our priority is on saving lives and we are still in the midst of search and rescue operations. I urge everyone in the affected areas to continue to follow instructions from state and local authorities. But as the relief effort ground into gear today, it was hard to know where in the devastated landscape had the worst of it. Some towns remain completely cut off, and Hurricane Katrina's true impact is still to be measured. Adam Brooks reporting, and while search and rescue operations represent the immediate priority, officials are also counting the financial cost of Hurricane Katrina. America's Gulf Coast is home to a major part of the country's oil industry, and the disruption has pushed prices to record highs. Oil companies are assessing the damage. The Gulf of Mexico is vital to the entire American oil infrastructure, with platforms, ports, pipes and refineries some now underwater. The area's been badly hit at all levels. Today, uh, the markets uh, were a bit panicky about the situation. Uh, obviously, yesterday, they felt uh, uh, good about the fact that uh, 
the damage was not as catastrophic, but by today, I think, the realization is that uh, the oil infrastructure has been severely hit. The oil business involves two main processes. First is production, getting it out of the ground. 95% of the Gulf of Mexico region's production has been shut. Next, the crude oil gets to a refinery where it's turned into useful products, mostly petrol and diesel. Nine refineries have been shut, a tenth of US refining capacity. It would be nice to think we had so much spare oil in the world we could afford to lose the Gulf of Mexico for a few days and barely notice. But it isn't like that. This is a very tightly run business. They don't sit on large amounts of spare oil doing nothing. Adding to the problem is the fact that global demand for oil has been growing and supply has barely been able to keep up. So there is no spare capacity in the world. As it happens, the US government does keep 700 million barrels of spare oil for a rainy day, the SPR, or Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Last year, the government lent crude oil to oil companies after Hurricane Ivan, but that may not help much this year. Why? Primarily because um, a lot of the refineries have been shut down. Um, crude oil doesn't really seem to be the problem. Um, the president, for example, has indicated his willingness to release crude from the SPR, but it's the uh, refining capacity that's the major problem. So in the U.S., because of the refining shortage, the retail price of gasoline may rise to a shocking $3 a gallon, 45p a litre. For petrol supplies in the U.K., the effect of the hurricane will be less obvious. But it's just what the oil market didn't need. Evan Davis, BBC News. Well, Jason Grumet is executive director of the National Commission on Energy Policy, a Washington research group looking into global environment and climate change. He says there's growing agreement in the scientific world of the link between climate change and Hurricane Katrina. I think that the eye of this storm um, reveals a great deal about uh, the struggles we have here in the U.S. and globally. I think that it is very, um, one must be very careful when trying to make a direct link between a particular reasonably localized effect and the broader global issues of climate change. But there is a growing scientific uh, agreement that the existence of the basically greater warming of the earth, the higher uh, sea levels, creates a greater risk of these kinds of dangerous storms. Well now, every international conclave attended by the Bush administration, America, it seems, is the lone voice holding out against really decisive action to tackle climate change. And at the same time, states and cities across the United States are going it alone, signing up to something very similar to the provisions of the Kyoto Protocol, for example. Which direction is this debate headed in? Jake, I think it's a, a very important point. I think actually um, a confluence of international, national and local events have really started to shift the debate here in the U.S. The, the recent G8 summit, and a lot of credit for this goes to uh, Prime Minister Blair, really helped to focus the world around three important facts. One is that we really moved beyond Kyoto. There's no real reasonable idea that the United States is going to join the Kyoto Treaty. Um, and I think that treaty and the debates about that have really become almost a, uh, a foil for inaction rather than an uh, obvious opportunity for action. Uh, but secondly, President Bush, for the first time on such a grand scale, acknowledged the uh, scientific consensus around climate change. And the G8 also brought uh, China and India and other countries into this discussion. So that's had a significant effect. Here in the U.S. Congress just uh, last month, the majority of the U.S. Senate adopted a resolution calling for economy-wide mandatory market-based controls that would slow, stop, and reverse U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. That's a tipping point in this debate, and it erases the uh, conclusion from a decade ago that the United States was not ready to begin this process. Finally, as you point out, there are very significant efforts being undertaken in the cities and states of this nation. Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Pataki of New York, Romney of Massachusetts, are all moving forward with plans. I, I would hesitate to suggest that they are in any way uh, equal in the uh, stringency to what was imagined for the U.S. under Kyoto. But they're significant steps. And when you put this all together, I think that there is a growing sense of inevitability that here in the United States we will join the world in moving forward with mandatory approaches to address climate change. Other news now, and the former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has announced he's to challenge the current Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, for the leadership of the Likud party. Mr. Netanyahu resigned as finance minister earlier this month after bitterly opposing Mr. Sharon's decision to forge ahead with the recent withdrawal of Jewish settlements from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. Well, Haggai Sigal is a lecturer on Middle Eastern politics with New York University in London, and he's just returned from Egypt, Israel and the occupied territories. He says it could be a messy fight. 
Well, it's remarkable. Um, Israel's very used to infighting between its political leaders, but the language of the last three days has been quite incredible. Um, directly today, out of the Prime Minister's office, uh, accusations of Netanyahu being a liar. Both have caused, called the other uh, completely incapable of being in government. Um, it's been already, and we're, we're already long away before this is even voted on in Likud, an incredibly messy fight between two people who are pretending to be fellow members of a government only weeks ago. Well now, Ariel Sharon has been thinking aloud recently about further pullbacks from settlements, retaining the major settlement blocks in the West Bank and basically pulling back from the others as part of a peace deal. That represents the centre ground of Israeli politics. Is that where Mr. Sharon is now headed? Well, I, this is, I think, the fascinating debate. The big thing in Israel is a discussion about what's been called the Big Bang thesis, an idea that Sharon, e either by being forced to or on his own choice, is going to break, is going to form a centrist party, which is, by the way, what he formed Likud to be in the first place when he established him in 1973, to take the, the right away from the extreme right towards the centre, and that he will have a, a, a potential coalition, a marriage of convenience between the centre and between the Israeli left, and that together they'll be able to forge this kind of position. Sharon, while very different from the Labour in many ways, I think now there are certain shared goals about some of the potential ways in which a peace process can be achieved, both in terms of what they believe is, is viable to give, but also what they believe they need to keep in terms of security. Mr Netanyahu won the election to become Prime Minister, beating Shimon Peres on the back of a wave of suicide bombings mm. in Israel. To what extent does the outcome of this struggle now depend on events on the ground? Uh, it's, it's a vital issue, and, and you're absolutely right. And what has been very interesting in the past is that the suicide bombs te have tended to be very strong when Labour prime ministers are trying to be re-elected, and they've tended not to happen when Likudniks have been in power. Some believe that this is almost a, 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 an I attempt to influence those kind of decisions, believing that almost a, a right-wing government might be good for, for the radicals. Uh, whether that's true or not, um, the potential effect of these things is tremendous. The fact that there have been no suicide bombs or very few for the last few months has allowed Sharon to withdraw from Gaza. If, the, if they had been on a daily or weekly basis, it would have been much harder for him to do so. So what happens there and also in terms of what Israel does, how the Palestinians react, and generally how the international community uh, view the actions of this government would be very important. And I think Sharon will be putting a lot of stock on his uh, speech to the UN soon, where he's hoping to be treated as a, as, a, as a hero and a peacemaker and use that for political capital within his own party and within inside Israel. Haggai Segal speaking to me earlier, and a former British finance minister or chancellor of the Exchequer, Kenneth Clark, has confirmed that he'll enter the race to lead Britain's opposition Conservative Party. Mr Clark, who's 65, has made two previous attempts to become leader. His pro-European views have made him unpopular in certain sections of the party in the past, but he recently described the single European currency as a failure. You're watching BBC News, still ahead on the programme. A new chapter in a writer's life. Salman Rushdie returns to the subject of Islam 16 years after the Satanic Verses. A Dutch woman thought to have been the world's oldest person has died at the age of 115. She passed away in her sleep at a nursing home in the north of the country. She had previously said her secret was a good diet and a love of football. Frail but feisty, Hendrika van Andelskeeper celebrated her 115th birthday in June. Born in 1890, she had lived through two world wars, saying her longevity was down to a daily diet of pickled herring and orange juice, apparently for the vitamins. But on Tuesday, she passed away in her sleep, something she had known was imminent. Last week she said, I think the moment is coming when the big management in the sky will say, it's been great, you've reached a great age, it's time for it to end, and that's what's happened. She'd been living in a nursing home for nearly 10 years. Before that, she'd looked after herself well into her hundreds. Friends remembered her with fondness. I remember the good years I spent with her, said this woman. She was a feisty lady. She knew what she wanted. The Guinness Book of World Records said the oldest living person was now a woman, also 115, living in the US state of Tennessee. Tim Allman, BBC News. The headlines this hour. A big rescue operation is continuing in Louisiana and Mississippi following the devastation brought about by Hurricane Cathedra, uh, Katrina. Many hundreds are feared dead. 
Former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he'll challenge Ariel Sharon for the Likud party leadership. Parliament in Zimbabwe has passed a series of changes to the constitution to restrict property rights. They'll deny farmers the right of appeal against the seizure of their land by the government. The ruling ZANU-PF party of President Mugabe used its two-thirds majority in parliament to approve the changes. The result of the count is that 103 honourable members have voted in favour of the third reading of the bill. The Law Society of Zimbabwe has described President Robert Mugabe's controversial bill as an undisguised assault on the rights of Zimbabweans. Only 29 parliamentarians voted against the amendments to the constitution. The opposition movement for democratic change said the legislation is another blow to democracy in Zimbabwe. Is this a constitutional bill? Of course not. A constitution is for all times. It's not for a particular group, for a specific uh, purpose, for a particular time. Under the legislation, white farmers will no longer be able to legally challenge land seizures. The farms will be effectively nationalised and the courts will be prohibited from hearing appeals. So far, around 4,000 white farmers have lost their properties under a government programme to redistribute land to the country's black population. The bill will also disenfranchise all those who have one or more foreign parents and who hold permanent residency status but not full citizenship. This will mainly affect white Zimbabweans of European descent. Those who've called for sanctions or military action against Mr Mugabe's government will be considered traitors and barred from travelling abroad. The legislation paves the way for a second chamber of parliament or senate. President Mugabe's ZANU-PF party already controls 107 seats in the 150-member lower house.